What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with John Gronsky. John is a retired major general and is the founder and CEO of Leader Grove LLC. John is a leadership and peak performance expert, a motivational storyteller, and a much sought after speaker and leadership seminar leader. His presentations feature inspirational stories and wisdom gained from his own leadership experiences and the experience of others. Now, in this episode, we talk about John's life experiences, everything from his time in the military to him riding his bicycle across the country with his wife and 15-month-old son, which he details in his book that I highly recommend you go grab. Um, But also, with that being said, we talk about how he led an army of 5,000 Army and Marine soldiers in Ramadi during the time when Ramadi was chosen as the most dangerous place on the planet. You're going to love this conversation. We talk about leadership. We talk about servant leadership. We talk about John's approach to really guiding individuals to greatness. I think you guys are going to love it. Now, before we get to the episode, I want to remind you guys that Growth Now Movement Live is coming. So head over to GNMLive.com, grab your tickets today, and join us. I cannot wait to see you guys there. Now, without further ado, let's get to the episode with General John Gronsky. General, welcome to the show. Hey, Justin, it's great to be on the show. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm excited. It was funny because I was talking with a mutual friend of ours, Ed Burns, and he goes, yeah, you know, I know, I know this general that was in the, in, in the military, and I think he'd be a really good guest. And this was, this was a while ago. We were, we were having a cigar. We had this conversation, and I was like, yeah, of course. Like, I, I think that things that are taught in the military can be life-changing. And then i I follow, like most people, I follow Jocko on Instagram and all of a sudden you pop up on his page. I'm like, I think this is the guy Ed mentioned. (laughs) And then like the very next day he's like, Hey, do you want me to introduce you? I'm like, yes. And so here we are. I'm excited to talk about your journey in life and the things that you've learned in leadership and everything else in between. But why don't we start with the, who is, who is General John Gronsky today? And then we'll, then we'll backtrack and we'll talk about all the craziness. (laughs) Okay. Well, well today uh, I'm a retired major general. I retired in June of 2019, and over the last year, I've been uh, developing a leadership consulting firm. I've written a book, uh, The Ride of Our Lives, Lessons on Life, Leadership, and Love, and I'm a professional speaker, so that's who I am today. That's awesome. So I want to go all the way back to your childhood, and I, I normally don't go this far back, but the way you were raised um, due to an unfortunate thing with your mother when you were a couple days old, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So your mother passed away when you were a couple days old. And so you were raised in a household with seven children and a single father. So what was that like growing up and what was the living situation and and what were the things that you took away from growing up in that manner? Yeah. Well, I, I remember the house being a a house of uh, a loving house. You know, I mean, I, I felt like I was loved. Uh, again, uh, with my mother passing away when I, you know, when I was three days old, as I grew up, I didn't know any differently. Uh, unlike my brothers and sisters who obviously had to deal with the grief of, of losing their mother. And, uh, my father was a hard worker. You know, he only had a seventh grade education, uh, was a world war II vet, uh, began a, his own business in 1954. So I think that's where I get a little bit of my entrepreneurial spirit from too. And uh, so he was consumed with developing the, this business. I mean, that's what he needed to feed seven children. Right. And, it's not cheap. You know, no, no. And even, even back in those days, in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, I had uh, an aunt, my brother's, uh, or I'm sorry, my, my father's sister, who, who really was like a surrogate mother to me. My two older sisters were like surrogate mothers. So felt a lot of love and uh, was a lot of hard work because 
growing up in a family business like that, you know, where your father owns a garage and a car, a used car lot, a towing service, it's kind of like growing up on a farm. You know, yeah. all the kids have to pitch in and, and work and contribute. Yeah, you know, my, it's funny, growing up, my dad owned a construction business. Uh, and, and I think this is the first time I ever said this out loud, but I was lucky enough to break my hips when I was 12 years old. So he never drug me into like climbing on roofs and ripping, <laughs> and ripping them apart. It's not easy work. Like I, I don't, I don't admire it, but it's, it's real work, right? It's, it's things that we need and you can make a great living doing it, which is, which is phenomenal. And I love hearing that your takeaway of how you grew up was full of love. Um, because I grew up in, in a not normal way, but like, it was just my life. Like it wasn't any different because that's kind of all I knew, right? But you see like the positives and all of that. But I imagine that there were a couple of key takeaways. I'm, I imagine you had to grow up pretty quickly. Um, and within yeah. that, did you ever learn yeah. leadership skills or any of these things that you're teaching now or took into the military at such a young age where it became innate? Well, I, I think uh, the leadership skills I learned really came just from observing my father. Uh, he was really... Uh, big about customer service, about, uh, you know, treating customers well so they would come back again. Uh, you know, he, he had about, you know, 40 people working in this large business that he eventually developed. And so, uh, you know, just, just the way he interacted with the employees, uh, you know, he made himself uh, be approachable. So no employee ever felt uh, like they couldn't bring him a, a problem they were having. So, yeah, I, I think just from observing, uh, I, I learned leadership and the way he interacted with, with others. No, for sure. And so what was the draw? Was, was the military like, you're, like that's what I wanted to do at a young age, or was it something that came later? What was the draw to that? Was it because your father was a veteran? Yeah, my father uh, encouraged me uh, to join the military, uh, but it, it wasn't something that at a young age I thought to myself, hey, I want to join the, the Army someday. Um, you know, I entered college, you know, University of Scranton after high school, and my father encouraged me to join the ROTC. And being a typical, you know, teenager, uh, not yet 20 years old, of course, I didn't do what my father wanted me to do. So I, I kind of, you know, shied away from joining the ROTC until uh, I got this letter in the mail between my sophomore and junior year in, in, in college, and it talked about going away to a, a basic camp at Fort Knox between my sophomore and junior year. And, you know, I, I just kind of made that decision on my own. And of course, my father was thrilled <laughs> that I was finally listening to his advice about, about joining the military because he believed in it. He thought, he thought everybody should have that experience. And uh, uh, he, was gr he was really uh, happy that I, I made that decision. But I ended up making that decision on my own. Very cool. So, was it your intention when you joined that you're like, this is going to be my lifetime of service? Because I mean, you were, I mean, what, what year again was it that you joined? Yeah, I actually went to that basic camp in 1976. And then I got my commission uh, as a second lieutenant two years later and, and, and entered the, the military on active duty in 1978. Wow. So obviously a lifetime of service. Was that always your intention when you signed up or you were just kind of following the waves of what came? I was following the waves of what came. Uh, I uh, uh, joined. I had I had a great four years in, in, in the army. You know, met my wife when I was stationed at, stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. Went up to uh, uh, Fort Lewis. I was you know uh, reassigned to Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, that's where our, our son Stephen was born. He was born at Madigan Ar Army Medical Center at Fort Lewis. So had a great four years. But after the four years. Uh, I decided to get out. Uh, you know, it was 1982. There wasn't really a lot going on uh, right. in terms of, uh, you know, what, what the military was involved in at that time. Uh, so I, I decided to get out. We were working up in, uh, in Tacoma, Washington for a bit and then decided to move back to northeastern Pennsylvania. So you, you brought your wife into PA, right? PA, yeah. PA proud. It's funny because I was saying to you before I hit record, I wasn't born here, but I love, I love the area. I love the state and everything else. And you're about 45 minutes from me. Um, and it's rare that I get to chat with somebody so local who's done so many great things in the world. And so when you came into Pennsylvania, and let's, let's talk about this book for a second. The insane journey that you and your wife decided to go on, um, that's just, that's crazy to me. I can't even wrap my head around the idea of what you guys did physically, emotionally, mentally, all the things in between. T talk, tell my audience a little bit about this journey that you and your wife decided to go on and, and then we'll get into the why. 
Yeah, well, you know, years before we made that journey, it was around probably 1976, I was 20 years old. Uh, 1976 was the, the bicentennial of, of the United States. And there was this group that in honor of the bicentennial, they created this bicycle route across the United States called the Bike Centennial Trail. It went from Oregon to Virginia. And I heard stories, you know, when I, when I was 20, uh, about these people biking across the United States, you know, using human power to get from one coast to the other, camping <laughs> out, all kinds of cool stories. And it was just something that, that I thought, man, I really want to do this someday. You know, it just really drew me in. And so um, when uh, Barry and I decided to uh, move back to Northeastern Pennsylvania, I gave it a little bit of thought. I'm thinking, wow, we're on the West Coast, moving to the East Coast. We're in between jobs. Like this is the ideal time if I'm ever going to fulfill this dream of mine to bicycle across the country. So I, I mentioned to my wife, uh, you know, she was, she was all in. And we, just, we didn't let the fact that we had a one-year-old son stop us. We figured, hey, we're going to do this as a team. We're going to do it as a family. So I ordered a bicycle trailer, which bicycle trailers back in 1983 are nothing like what the bike trailers are today. They're not super was, lightweight and easy to ride with. <laughs> no, no. It was this 25-pound when it was empty, and it was this big orange. It looked like a Conestoga trailer, and so there's a lot of wind drag on it. But, uh, you know, we, we kind of did a little bit of custom work on it to make it right for our son, Stephen, by putting – you know, a better shoulder harness on the seat and everything and put a screen on the back of it. And uh, we, we made our way across the country and it was a fantastic adventure. Wow. And, and to, to bring such a young child along with you, like I don't have a child of my own, but I live with my girlfriend and she has a nine and a seven year old. And um, that's enough as it is. And, and we drove to Cape Cod one time in a car and I couldn't handle that. I couldn't imagine what it was like um, you know, doing this, like, what, what were some of the experiences trying to, well, first of all, how long was the journey time-wise? Yeah, it, it was three months. We started in late May, got back to Northeastern PA in, in late August. We took a circuitous route. We didn't take the most direct route. We started in Tacoma, Washington, went all the way down to Pueblo, Colorado, before wow. we headed east across the state of Kansas and then in the Missouri. So we, we crossed the Cascade Mountains in Oregon, the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming, the Ozarks in Missouri, the Appalachians as we were coming into Pennsylvania. Uh, three months on the road, over 4,000 miles, a two-man backpacking tent, two sleeping bags, and all of our gear stuffed into bicycle packs that run our bicycles. Unreal. Like, and, and keep in mind, people that are listening, like we're used to cell phones and GPS and all these things. And it states right on your website as a reminder, you know, a little, little uh, thing from your book. There was no cell phones. There was nothing. There was a, a pay phone you might run across every once in a blue moon uh, if you needed any help with anything. Now, obviously, I imagine the military training helped you in this journey. It did. You know, I mean, I was used to being in the field and, and uh, you know, had some uh, field craft skills and that type of thing as far as camping. And, uh, you know, again, the, the army, you know, just through the, the nature of the training helps you become a more resilient person, uh, you know, toughens you up a little bit. So yeah, I, I have that going for me. My wife, you know, is from Austria. So, you know, she grew up in, on a farm in Austria in the late fifties and, and, and sixties, and they didn't even have running water, you know? Wow. They, they, yeah. I mean, they literally had had an outhouse, you know, she went, she went to a one room schoolhouse in, in Austria. Cause again, you're, you're talking, you know, she's the same age I am. So, you know, she started going to school in the early sixties and that's just how it was in Austria back then, uh, especially yeah. in the, in the rural area she was from. So she was, she was kind of toughened up uh, from the, the farm life she was used to growing up too. Yeah. Well, so during this, the three month journey and the three month trek that you, you really detail in your book and we'll highlight the book again later, but you, what did you learn about yourself during this, this journey? Yeah, I, I learned that um, it really takes a team. Uh, it, it's, it's not about just what you could do. You know, you could be the strongest guy on the team, but you still got to work within the team. And, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, there, there's eight people on a crew boat rowing. And if only one, you know, if one guy is like the really strongest rower by far, you know, that team is not going to, win any races they're probably going to go around in a circle yeah and so you know I, I really learned that hey 
you know, I mean, obviously, you know, one of our teammates was a 15 month old baby. Uh, so we had to account for that. You know, we had, we had to stop every two hours and let Steven get out of the trailer and, and run around and play a little bit. Uh, and you know, you just have to account for all your teammates. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing I learned. No, for sure. And I would love to have gone on that trek if I could have been like Steven and <laughs> being pulled the whole time, which is crazy. <laughs> what did you learn about your wife and your marriage during those three months? Yeah, I, I learned that my wife and, and, and this has proven um, true through the course of the, the last 40 years that we've spent together, uh, that, that she is just an extremely supportive person. You know, she, she decided to, to rigor the challenges of that trip because she knew that's something I wanted to do. And so, you know, she placed, uh, you know, my goal ahead of any goals that, that, that she had. And, that, and that's the way uh, it's been a lot, uh, you know, a lot of our life. You know, uh, you know the times that I've been away f- uh, from home uh, for up to a year and a half, uh, you know, with, with various military uh, uh, deployments and, and other military assignments that I've had, you know, she stood by me uh, and, and she's done everything she, she could do to keep the the family together back at home while I, while I've been away occasionally. Yeah, for sure. And what about being a father to a young son? Did you learn anything as far as that during this journey? No, just uh, the the thing I learned and, you know, on that journey and then through the rest of my parenting years, which by the way, are still continuing. uh, (laughs) Parenting never stops no matter how old the the kids get uh, is, is that it's all about showing them that you love them. You know, if, if you show a child at any age, whether it be 15 months old or 38 years old, that you love them and you care about them, uh, that carries the day. That, that, that's really what I think uh, children want out of their parents. I love it. So now you, you make your way to Pennsylvania and you start this life and you're drawn back into the military. Like it doesn't stop after the four years, obviously, because now, you know, you go on to this prolific career. What drew you back in? Was it necessity? Was it desire? Uh, what what was the thought process for that? You know, um, I, I was out for about a year before I got back in, and I read somewhere that for many people that that get back into the military, it's usually about one or two years after they've gotten out, uh, because you know, in the military, uh, you're with people, you're with a diverse group of people that have like values, which is very very interesting when you think of it yeah. that way. And there's a great deal of camaraderie, a great deal of working together as a team. And uh, when I, you know, heard about this National Guard Armory in downtown Scranton, that I should go down there and talk to the guys about the Pennsylvania National Guard. I had no idea what the National Guard was at the time, to be honest with you. But I went down there and there were some good people there who uh, impressed me. And uh, that's what made me want to join, give it, give it another shot. And it was, you know, one of the best decisions I ever made in my life to come back into the military again. Yeah. So now what I know of the national guard, that's the one that they promote is like a weekend, a month, two weeks, a year, all that stuff. Right. But also it becomes, you get called in to, for war, you get called in for all these things, like almost like, Hey, we need your help. Get over here now. Right. So what were you doing along with that? Like I've worked with some, some guys who are in the, uh, I don't know what the, I don't know what the Marines call it, but the similar thing. It's, like the, a, it's a, the Marine Reserves. Okay. So the Marine Reserves, I have some friends that do that, but I also, I met him when he was in the Marine Reserves and I worked with him as well. So usually you're living like this dual life at this point, you know, doing the military stuff, but also doing the stuff at home. What were you trying to do at that point? Yeah. Uh, well, after I got back to Northeastern Pennsylvania for the next 15 years, I worked in the family business there. So I, I worked there, uh, you know, from when I returned in 83 until 1998, I served in the National Guard at the same time. And you're right. Uh, before 9-11, it was a sense, essentially one weekend a month of training, and then you also did another two weeks at some point in the year, usually in the summer of, of two weeks of, of annual training. Uh, of course, all that changed after 9-11, where that's where the National Guard has been used very heavily over the last 20 years with combat deployments and other deployments overseas. Now, in addition to that, the National Guard also answers to the governor. So if there's a, uh, a natural disaster or, God forbid, a man-made disaster, the governor could call the National Guard out, you know, hurricanes, floods, snowstorms, that type of thing. That's very common in Pennsylvania, you know, those type of things for the uh, National Guard to get 
called out on uh, even before 9-11, obviously, uh, you know, get right. called and, and help people uh, support civil author authorities during these natural disasters. Yeah. Now, you said in, until 1998, you were within the family business. Did you end up going back full time into the military? Now, let me preface this conversation with I know some of it, but not all of it because I haven't yeah. heard the whole thing. Right. Um, so did you go did you end up going back full time? No, in 1998, uh, I decided to leave the family business. I had been there 15 years. I just wanted to grow with other experiences, just like many people do. And, and uh, I decided to uh, move down to Southern Berks County, and I worked for a consulting firm just outside of Philadelphia. So we did a lot of um, information technology, project management, consulting for Fortune 500 companies, you know, utility companies, telecommunications companies, healthcare. Uh, so I did most of my work in the Philadelphia region, but some of the work was in other parts of the country, such as Chicago, Denver, uh, you know, other places like that. So I, I did that for 13 years. And then it was in 2011 uh, when the adjutant general, who was basically the, the two-star general, which, uh, who was the commander of all the National Guard forces, in the state of Pennsylvania, that in general asked me to come on full time uh, in, in 2011, and I did. And I stayed full time until I retired last year. Oh, wow. So what was, what was the reasoning that they asked you to come on full time? Was it your dedication? Was it just everything that you executed on? Yeah, I, I think it was because of my experience. You know, I served a year uh, over in Lithuania in the year 2000. Uh, after 9-11, I took 2,000 soldiers over to Europe uh, wow. to uh, uh, do a force protection mission at, at U.S. installations in four different countries in Europe. And then I uh, commanded a brigade in Ramadi, Iraq in 2005 and 2006. And that, at that uh, point in time, and anybody you know, will tell you this, it's just fact, it was the most dangerous place on the face of the earth at that time in 2005 and 2006. And, and a little bit before that and a little bit after that as well. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, commanded 5,000 soldiers and Marines in, in, in Ramadi. So it was a defining period in my life. Uh, you know, learned a lot about leadership there, learned a lot about myself, learned a, a, a lot about uh, just, just how many great Americans we have serving in our military. Yeah, let's talk about that. So 5,000 soldiers in the most dangerous place on earth at the time. What was that... I don't even know where to begin. What was that like leading those men um, through what could potentially be a human reaction of fear, um, uncertainty, and all these things? How were you able to command and lead such a large group of individuals? Yeah, I, I think the thing that allowed me to do it uh, was the fact that I was the commander and it was my duty to lead those 5,000 soldiers and Marines. I, I think that's the simplicity of it, really. Uh, it was just my duty. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you, you just couldn't shirk a duty like that. It was too important. Uh, it was too violent. Uh, there, you know, I, I lost 82 of my uh, soldiers and Marines while I was over there. Wow. Uh, I had another uh, well over uh, 250 who were wounded seriously enough where they had to be evacuated back to the United States. I mean, it was, it was very violent and chaotic uh, at that time. Uh, we had over uh, 1,000 roadside bombs used against my brigade in the one year we were there. Uh, sniper wow. fire, mortar fire, rocket fire, uh, you know, all of that. And you just had to deal with it. I mean, that was our job. And, you know, if, if, if somebody had to do it, uh, you know, why not us? I mean, you know, some army brigade had to do that job and uh, we were selected to do it. And, and the credit goes to those soldiers and Marines who, who serve there. It certainly doesn't go with me at all. Uh, those soldiers and Marines, they were in the fight every day. Uh, you mentioned fear. Yes, they had fear, uh, but they, they had the ability to overcome that fear. And that's really what courage is all about. Courage is really the ability to overcome fear. Yeah. And, and uh, they served very honorably. They treated the, the Iraqi civilians there with dignity and respect. 
And uh, I am just so proud of the work that those soldiers and Marines did in a very tough environment. Where does courage come from? Yeah, I, I think uh, courage, as I mentioned, I really, I mean, I was afraid a lot over there, uh, but still had to go out and do what I had to do. Uh, and that's why I say I believe courage is the ability to overcome fear. And I think that comes with training. That comes with understanding the Army values. You know, uh, duty is one of the Army values. And, and just understanding that you have a duty to do. Uh, you know, honor is another Army value. So, you know, uh, understanding that you have that honor of all of those soldiers that went before us and made those sacrifices before us knowing that we have a great country and the blessings that we have in this country are worth making a sacrifice for. I mean, all of that comes together in, right. in order to instill courage in a person, I believe. And, and sure. the other thing, the other thing that instills courage is, is the buddies that you're there with, you know, uh, I mean, truly, and, and this has been said many times when you're in a combat situation, you, you uh, display that courage and you display that sense of duty really for the buddy to your, to your left and the buddy to your right. That, that's really who you're doing it for at that, at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're family at that point. You know, it's like a brotherhood. A absolutely. And, uh, you know, we say brotherhood. I, I, I did have 200 female soldiers in my brigade. That's awesome. Uh, and, and I'll tell you those, uh, I had an MP platoon there uh, of about 40 soldiers, 40 MPs. 50% of them were female in that platoon, and they were out just about every day. The platoon sergeant was a female uh, soldier. Uh, we had uh, females uh, driving trucks, uh, moving equipment, logistical equipment that we needed mm -hmm. uh, from one forward operating base to another over a roadside bomb infested roads. So uh, I just give all the credit to uh, our male soldiers and, and, and our female soldiers who worked together, and there was no difference uh, between the warrior spirit, uh, any of them displayed. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned that you learned so much about leadership while you were over there. I want to dive into leadership a bit with you, um, because this is truly, you know, obviously where you shine, right? This is where you go into corporations and speak at events and all these things. And you speak on leadership. What, first of all, I want to ask you, what is leadership to you? Um, but then also what are some of the things that you obviously look, here's the thing you went over there in a leadership role. But you then said, I learned so much about leadership. So let's, let's start with what is leadership, and then we'll get into the things that you were learning, even though you were already in a leadership role. Yeah. Um, to me, leadership is all, uh, all about character, competence, and resilience. Um, and I think, I believe character is foundational to leadership. Uh, you have to have strong character, which means you have to have, uh, understand what your core values are and adhere to those core values, even in, in difficult times. By doing that, by displaying integrity, uh, which is hopefully part of one's core values, you are able to grow trust in, in the organization. Uh, and, and then you have to dis, uh, display care for those you lead. And when I say display care for those you lead, that means putting the welfare of those you lead uh, above your own welfare. And that's easy to say, but very hard to do. But to be a, a good leader, especially in a tough situation, you've got to be able to do that. And then with competence, you know, that's all, uh, all about providing a vision or a purpose to those you lead. It's all about having the courage to make decisions. Uh, and it's all about being able to communicate, you know, to, to communicate well to those you lead and, and uh, be clear, concise, and communicate early and off, and don't have, don't have your followers wondering what the heck is going on. You know, be transparent and, and, and let them know what, what, what's happening. And then resiliency. And resiliency is all about having positive energy. You know, it's not about being an energy sponge, it's about, it's about being an energy generator. It, it, it's about being fit, and I just don't mean physical fitness, although physical fitness is a part of it but it's yeah. about being mentally fit. It's about being emotionally fit. And then the third part of resiliency, and remember resiliency is really, to me, all about overcoming adversity. The third part of resiliency is allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And what that means is allow yourself to be uh, approachable. Uh, you know, uh, Allow yourself to be a, a leader where 
where those followers of yours feel okay with approaching you and bringing you their, their problems. And, uh, you know, there's, there's an old saying that, you know, when a, when a leader, uh, when, when a leader uh, creates an environment where soldiers stop bringing that leader their problems, then that leader ceases being a leader. Uh, so that, that, that's where vulnerability comes in. Vulnerability is all about, uh, you know, taking the time to, uh, to talk to those that you lead and have conversations with them about mistakes that you made and times that you tried something that you might have failed at. You know, that shows your followers that you're not a robot. You have emotions. Uh, that shows your uh, followers that, that, you know, you're not perfect and you've made mistakes. And really, that's the best way to learn. It's yeah. just through mistakes rather than through success. And so, again, I, I believe those are the, the key elements of, of being a leader. And I love that you say that, you, you know, you talk about being vulnerable and open about your mistakes and, and showing emotion and all these things. Because I think a lot of times when, look, I haven't been in the military. I, have, I do have friends who were and, and have had some incredible conversations like this in the past. But like how it's painted to the public, right? To, through movies or whatever. And I know movies have their own thing, but it's, it's painted as like these, pardon my French, these hard ass dudes who don't show any emotion and no matter what, but you're saying it's the exact opposite. It's about, it's about relating to and letting them know that it's okay. Right? Yeah. You know, I think if you watch the movie series, Band of Brothers, you know, when you see how, you know, Major Winters, you know, uh, conducted himself with the troops versus, Captain Sobel, who was the company commander of, of that particular company as they were going through, through training in Georgia. You see, you see the difference between a tyrannical leader and a servant leader. And a lot of people say to me, you know, why be a servant leader? You know, what good is being a servant leader? Yeah. And you know, why, why can't you lead like a tyrant? And I say, yes, you could lead like a tyrant and you could be successful for maybe one win or maybe two wins. But if you want to have long-term sustained success, and if you want to be a champion, that's where servant leadership comes in. Uh, and, and you could see, again, you, you just using that, that movie series, Band of Brothers, you could see the difference between a tyrannical leader and, and a servant leader who Major Winter cer certainly was a servant leader. Yeah, and that's, and that's the one that's going to strike the chord. If you're, if you're watching it, that, he's the one who's going to strike the chord with you. I imagine those men who served under you, you struck a chord with, with many of them as well. Now, obviously leading 5,000 people, what does that even, what does that even look like? I, I, I can't imagine you've spent one-on-one -on -one time with all 5,000 of them. Were you leading a crew that would then go out? How, how does that look? Yeah. Um, you know, interesting thing about leading large organizations, because after I commanded that brigade, I eventually went on to command the 28th infantry division, which is 15,000 soldiers. Um, uh, but an interesting thing about leading large organizations, Field Marshal Slim, who was a British field marshal, field marshal during World War II, he was in the India, China, Burma theater. Uh, he wrote a, a, a book, uh, Defeat in the Victory. And, and in that book, he talks about the fact that when you lead a large organization, it's not important that that leader gets to know every person in that large organization, but the leader has to get around enough so every person in that large organization feels that they know that leader. Mm. Isn't that an interesting thing? That you is. And, 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 I, and I read that and I remembered that. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing, you know, e even in Ramadi, you know, if I, I went out and I would uh, visit a, a company, uh, which is about, let's say, 140 men or so, uh, men and women, uh, even if all the soldiers in that 140 soldier company did not see me when I visited that company. Just the fact that I visited the company, every soldier felt like they saw me, uh, which right. is kind of interesting. So it's really just, uh, uh, you know, not relying on reports, but getting out often enough so you could see and feel things. You, know, you could see things with your own eyes. You could feel things with the, with the other senses that you have. You could look into the eyes of a, of a subordinate leader and, and see how they're feeling. Or you could look into the eyes of, of a soldier and kind of get a sense for what they're thinking. Uh, so it, it's extremely important. I tell executives this all the time in, in large companies. You've got to get out from beyond, behind a desk 
you got to get out and, and talk to your employees and just kind of get a sense uh, by the tone of their voice, by the look in their eyes, how they're feeling. It tells you a lot more than a written report will. No, for sure. And, and I love all of that stuff. You know, I believe that success uh, in anything in our life comes from consistency and discipline, um, you know, and, and attacking life in that way. So my question for you is, what are the things that you're put, you've instilled into your life consistently through discipline uh, that has ensured the success that you've had across? Look, you got to look at the success of family business, corporate world, military, now public speaking and, and corporate training and all this stuff. What are the things that you've instilled in your life to ensure the success in all of those? Yeah, I, I really try to keep a balanced life. Um, you know, loyalty is also an army value. value and and uh, I had a senior leader tell me one time that loyalty just doesn't mean loyalty to your unit. Or again, to transfer this to business, loyalty doesn't mean just loyalty to your company but it also means loyalty to your, to your family. Uh, so, you know, leading a balanced life and uh, ensuring that I give my family the time they deserve along with the work I'm doing. Uh, I, I think that's a, a really important thing. And then, you know, having self-discipline. You know, I do get up early every morning, even when I don't have to, uh, because I, it gives me a little bit of time to think and get myself in order. I, 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 I do uh, physical training every day to some extent. Just this morning, my wife and I did a, a 32 mile bike ride uh, that I just finished up right before jumping on the podcast here. And, um, you know, I don't do a 32 mile bike ride every day, but I, but I integrate some type of physical training into my, my daily regimen. You know, eating healthy, uh, you know, making sure you, you drink enough water. I mean, just all those basic things. Uh, having spiritual fitness, uh, you know. Whatever that means to you, you know, yeah. spiritual fitness, just, just understanding that there's, there's a greater world out there. There's a greater power out there. And, and you know, if, if that means meditating a little bit or if that means, you know, reading something from whatever scripture you might believe in and just thinking about that, uh, you know, uh, so spiritual fitness is, is extremely important. Emotional fitness is important. And I, I I certainly recommend that people read books by Daniel Goleman, who wrote about uh, emotional intelligence and, and, and think about, you know, how you could integrate the aspects of emotional intelligence into your life, because that's something that could be trained, just like leadership could be trained. And, yeah. you know, we, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, hey, you know, you were over in Ramadi and you were still trying to, you know, learn and, and develop as a leader. Absolutely. I'm 64 years old now served in the army for 40 years. And right now today, I'm still trying to learn how to become a better leader. Uh, I don't think learning should ever stop. I think when you stop learning, you stop growing. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to try to, to become even better as a leader today, even after my military career. Yeah. And, and guys, if you're listening to that, he did say 64 and he did I will confirm he did say 32 miles on the, on the bike, which is, which is unbelievable. But that's, but that is so, it's an example of the consistency you brought into your life across the board and the discipline to stay fit, to stay, you know, continue. I mean, I've met six, I remember when my grandmother was 60 and she looked like she was 110 years old. Like when you said your age, I almost fell out of my chair. Cause I was like, there's no way. All right. Because that, but that's what it is. It's about keeping yourself in a position where you can always be a leader at any given moment and everything else follows suit. Right. And I love what you, you know, what you bring to the table and, and this conversation has been absolutely incredible. Now, before I get to the final question that I ask everybody, I want to ask you all the important stuff. Where do people find you online? How can they get the book uh, and all that good stuff? Yeah. Hey, th thanks for asking that. Yeah. I, I think the easiest way to connect with me is to go to my website, which is very easy johngronsky.com and gronsky is spelled g-r-o-n-s-k-i johngronsky.com and there's links to my other uh, social media sites there you know i'm pretty active on instagram on facebook on linkedin and on twitter uh and so that, that's the best way to connect with me as far as my book is concerned best best place to get it is either at amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com and uh you know you just go there and get it if you want to drop me an email uh, my email is john at johngronsky.com. Uh, and if you, if you let me know that you want a signed copy of my book, I'll be gl glad to do that for anybody personally who connects with me by email. I'll let you know what the cost is and, 
and that'll include shipping. And, uh, you know, I'll get your address from you and, and I'll get a, a, a personalized signed copy of, a, of the book off, off in the mail to anybody who connects with me at john at johngronsky.com. That's awesome. General, this conversation has been amazing. I'd love to have you on the show again in the future because I'm sure there's so much we didn't tap into uh, for sure. But like I said, I wrap up every single interview uh, with this same question. And since this show is called The Growth Now Movement, the question is, in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Uh, I, think, uh, I think the two defining periods in my life where I grew the most, one was that bicycle trip that I took back in 1983 with my wife and 15-month-old son. And then the second one was that period where I commanded that, that brigade in, in Ramadi, Iraq. Certainly, those were two defining periods in my life that I've, I've learned a lot from and I think about quite, quite frequently. For sure. General, again, thank you so much for uh, coming on and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for serving this country for the, uh, the crazy amount of time that you did in the way that you did. Uh, and thank you for continuing to serve this country by teaching something that's so important like leadership. Guys, honestly, go reach out to him. Uh, get that signed copy. If you're listening and you have a corporation that needs this kind of talk, reach out to him and book him. But this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, Justin, if I could say one thing before we, we end. For sure. I just I, I want to thank you for the message you get out there. I've listened to uh, several of your podcasts, and you get out a great message all the time. And uh, I, I'm happy you do that because this is a message uh, based on on the work you do to put this podcast together uh, that that people need to hear. So thank you for doing this consistently, time and time again. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for saying that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.